Good evening, and welcome to our review of mitosis and meiosis. So let's first start our story off with mitosis, because that's what we did first. Mitosis is part of the cell cycle, and the cell cycle consists of four or five parts, depending on how you want to really think about it. G1 is when the cell is going to grow, very important. In there, if any cellular components are going to be replicated, but not the chromosomes, not yet. There will be able to synthesize ATP in the mitochondria. You will be able to uh, generate any ribosomes. You will be able to do any protein synthesis. Anything that would be normal cell things as a cell will do during G1. Uh, growing, of course, would also be one of those things. Now, once a cell is in G1, it means two things. It means that a batch of cells just came out of mitosis slash cytokinesis, and they are in G1, and they are growing. Now, from G1, you have a couple of choices. You can either A, leave the cell cycle and form what is known as G0, or where your cell cycle has arrested, or you will no longer divide. And that will happen in liver cells in humans. It happens in muscle cells. It happens in brain cells. But they can be brought, some of them can be brought out of G0, like liver cells, in the event of a transplant. From there, you will, the cell could move on to what is known as the S phase. Now, the S phase is where any DNA you have will be replicated or it will double. So that is where your DNA replication will occur, S for synthesis or replication. And that, of course, happens between G1 and G2. So if you know that you are in G2, let's just say, you have already replicated your chromosomes. So that's important. What they're going to try to do in these questions is trick you. So by the time you get to G1, now you're double-checking for any errors or any mistakes, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in when we talk about the checkpoints in G1, the end of G2, and the M phase of mitosis, and that how P53 works, but we'll talk about that a little later. That whole process, G1 through S through G2, is known as interphase. Interphase is not, 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 not mitosis and the chromosomes are not visible. So it is important to understand that it is by far the longest stage of the cell cycle as far as time goes. And you cannot see the chromosomes. They are called chromatin at that point. So you may see that coming up. And once again, that is the uncoiled DNA. And in that case, they're also loosely packed to allow for any replication that will occur during interphase and any protein synthesis that may occur. So as for the cell cycle, that is it. And remember, it is different for every cell. And again, some cells will do it faster, things like skin cells. Others will not do it at all after they have been made like brain cells or neurons. There are many ways to regulate the cell cycle. There are internal factors and external factors. There are local regulators. There are growth factors. Now, growth factors should make sense. And if there is a receptor, let's just say, on a cell, and the growth factor fits right into that receptor, that will trigger the cell to divide. There are other things that will regulate if that happens or not, and they are density dependence and um, anchorage dependence, and they will not have a cell divide if they are in contact with other cells. And if they do divide because of that, there must be some sort of problem, and that would be how cancer works. So... One of the major internal regulators is the cyclin CDK kind of junction, if you will. So what's going to happen is we have to remember a few things about these things called CDKs. And if you look at this picture here, they make the CDK kind of look like a little purple box with a little kind of little cutout in it. Now, they could have probably drawn a CDK up here, too, if they wanted to, just to kind of drive the point home that CDKs are always present. 
And there are many different cyclins in CDK kind of junctions there, but we're going to talk primarily about the M version. And what's going to happen here is these cyclins are proteins. So, whoops. Uh, the purple's not showing up so good. So the proteins are going to accumulate as the cell cycle progresses. So you can see here this kind of cyclin accumulates arrow. And as the cyclins begin to accumulate, they're going to join up with the CDK and form what is known as an MPF. And it's a maturation promoting factor or a mitosis performing promoting factor, whatever you feel like calling it, it doesn't really matter. You're not going to see that. Just know that MPF is the kind of combined molecule. Now, if you notice, that correlates directly with the M phase. That is this that is this particular cyclin, so be careful on that. Once the cell goes through division and mitosis and cytokinesis, then all of these cyclins are degraded. You can see them kind of breaking down right there, and that will allow for the new cells in G1 to go through this same process. So you're going to notice here that CDKs or cyclin-dependent kinases are always present. They are only activated when the cyclin joins them. They can be deactivated by something called P21, which we will see later. And P21, if it is around, actually shuts off the cell cycle. And we're going to see why that is important when we talk about the repair of the DNA. It's going to phosphorylate proteins, and we know phosphorylating proteins can either turn them on or turn them off, do whatever they need to do. And once again, when they combine, they're called MPFs. And then once you have MPFs in this example, mitosis can occur and the cell can divide. So if you look at this graph here, they're kind of in direct correlation where as your cyclins increase, your MPF activity increases until you max out during the mitosis phase. At that point, your cyclins are going to drop, as you can see right there. They will work their way up through the cycle, reach a maximum point, divide, repeat. So that will happen over and over and over again, hence the cell cycle. So in conclusion, if a cell is in G1, which we said was in the growth phase over here, we know that it can either go on to G0, which could happen, or you know that it just came out of mitosis and may start the cycle again. So those are our two giveaways if cells are in G1. Okay, so that's what we said there. You can either move into the G0 phase, or you know that you just came out of mitosis. So what the heck is mitosis? Well, mitosis is where two nuclei are formed. Now, it's pretty important to understand that that does not necessarily mean two cells. It could go on to form those two cells by what is known as cytokinesis. And it probably will happen, but it's not guaranteed. So be careful on that. And by the time you get to mitosis, you know that DNA is not replicated because it already was replicated. So that's a classic trick. So if you look here at this picture, you know that these two blues are going to be called sister chromatids, and they are, in essence, the chromosome that has been replicated. These are also sisters right there. Now, let's say that these are both chromosome number one, let's just say. Let's say that that's mom's number one, and this is dad's number one. Then these guys are considered homologous, and homologous simply means that they are the same chromosome number. They have the same genes, but they're not exactly the same because one came from mom and one came from dad. Okay, so in prophase, a bunch of things are going to happen. The chromosomes are going to condense. Now you can actually see them with a microscope. These spindle fibers are going to form and they're going to branch out from what is known, if it's an animal cell, from a centriole to the centromere of the replicated chromosomes. So that's what's going on over there. And through prometaphase, they may stick in here sometimes. They will put prometaphase as a step. That's kind of like an in-between step between prophase and metaphase. But during metaphase, you can see here, the chromosomes are lined up down the middle of the cell, otherwise known as the metaphase plate. 
So once you see that they form this metaphase plate, or they are down what they may refer to as the equator of the cell, the next step will be anaphase. And anaphase are when the chromatids are going to separate, and they're going to be these really cool things called kinetochores, which are motor proteins in the central mere region, which are going to allow for the movement of the now sister chromatids forming now daughter chromosomes to move on. This splitting of chromatids happens in mitosis, and we will also see it again in meiosis 2, so be very careful. Meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 are different. Telophase is to distribute the chromosomes to the daughter nuclei meaning the new nuclei will form. Technically at this point, they have not split yet. The final splitting will come during cytokinesis, which again, sometimes is included and sometimes not. If it is mitosis, this will form two diploid cells, meaning they are exactly what they started with. And diploid means you have a copy of each chromosome from each parent. Then when we talk about the act of cytokinesis, we will see two different versions. We will see the animal cell version, and you can tell this is an animal cell primarily because it is round or not square, and I do not see a cell wall. But what's going to happen is the cell membrane is going to pinch in a little bit, and that pinching in is known as a cleavage furrow. And it's going to happen with these cool contractile rings that are going to pull it in, sort of kind of like if you put a rubber band around a balloon. And eventually the new, you see here, it'll eventually pinch in enough where you will end up with two cells that are now distinctly different from each other. And that's in animal cells, which we call a cleavage furrow. In plant cells, it's a little bit different because here you need these Golgi-derived vesicles. And anytime we talk about a vesicle, it's a little thing that's going to carry something. And what's going to happen here, these little vesicles are going to kind of deposit little bits that are soon to be going to become the cellulose that are going to form a cell plate initially. So plate are found in plants, which will eventually go on to build the new cell wall. So once you get to the cell wall, the cells have officially been divided through cytokinesis. So all of that happens in somatic cells, which we refer to as body cells. If you're talking about a plant, this happens big time in the roots. And the roots are important because they're growing down into the ground. So a lot of the experiments will use what are known as root tips. And you will see a lot of mitosis in the root tip of a plant. Now let's get into meiosis. Now meiosis, a little bit different story. Instead of making two diploid cells, you're going to make four haploid cells. And meiosis will allow you to have any genes from the parents get shuffled. That is why you may or may not look like your parents and or your siblings, all due to meiosis, forming these things called gametes. In males, they are called sperm, and in females, they are called eggs. Also, super important to understand, each one created is genetically different. Helps for variation in the next generation, which is great. So let's start off with meiosis 1. Once again, is it, a, it is a two-part story. Meiosis 1 has one replication event and one division event. Meiosis 2 is only going to have the division, so that's important. One replication event and one division event. So prophase 1 is probably the most important because that's where all of your variation is going to come into play. Here, you're going to have these replicated homologous chromosomes, which are going to be called tetrads because they're made up of what look like four individual bits. For example, just, you know, one, two, three, four. So that's your tetrad. And what's going to happen is this tetrad is going to form this kind of this act of synapsis. So synapsis is this laying of homologous chromosomes on top of each other. Then the exact place where they meet is going to be called the chiasma or chiasmata. That's where they'll meet. And then when they eventually separate apart, 
you'll see that some of the material was swapped. Now that swapping of material is known as crossing over, or where you're mixing up some of the genes from each of the parents, they may call that recombinance. So we will see that coming up in the next chapter. An actual picture here kind of looks exactly as they said. See as all kind of mixing and matching. So those are the tetrads mixing and matching and ultimately crossing over information. So crossing over once again happens between homologous chromosomes, not sister chromatids, very important, not sister chromatids, happens in prophase one, and it leads to recombining of the DNA and a lot of genetic variation. Now, as for the next couple of phases, you don't need to get super detailed on what goes on, but you need to recognize it. And in metaphase one of my osis, you will notice that the homologous chromosomes line up next to each other, not on top of each other. And in anaphase 1, you will see the, the actual pair separate. So pay very close attention to that. In anaphase 1, the homologous pairs separate. So the homologous pairs, let's add that right there. Then by the time you get to telophase 1, which is only the first part of the story, you will see here how the two nuclei are starting to form. And you have now, this is where things get really, really tricky. Each cell has half of the chromosomes, but it has the same exact amount of DNA. So you've got to be really careful. You're going to have one of each chromosome in this case, so half of what you started with. And, but, I'm sorry, you're going to have equal amounts of DNA because remember there was a replication event. So when you replicate and you divide, you end up with the same exact amount of DNA. But it's genetically different, so that's what makes things a little bit crazy. And remember, you will have half as many chromosomes as you started with. Now meiosis 2, this is where things get a little bit tricky. In meiosis 2, you can see that now everything lines up down the middle of the cell, and you're ultimately going to separate your sisters. Wow, that sounds like something we talked about in mitosis. By the time all is said and done with the mixing and the matching, you will end up with four cells, each now with half of the amount of DNA and half of the chromosomes. Now, the reason why... There's half of the amount of the DNA is because, remember, in meiosis 2, we just split. We did not replicate. So that's very, very important that there's just the splitting, no replication. And to wrap it all up, let's do a little bit of math, do a little kind of, kind of bookkeeping, if you will. In mitosis, you start off with one cell that's going to break off into two cells that are exactly the same. They will both be diploid, so you start diploid and you end diploid. They will have equal number of chromosomes. They will be genetically identical. And that's what makes mitosis so important. Now, meiosis different story. Here, there's two stages. In the first stage, you end up with two cells that, once again, have half the chromosome number but equal amounts of DNA because there was replication, then division. After meiosis 2, there's only splitting, so just division. That's it. So your two cells turn into four cells. In this case, they are genetically different. They will have half of the amount of DNA, and they will have, have half of the amount of chromosomes. So we've now seen that many times. So if they give you a bunch of examples, let's say mom's chromosome 1, dad's chromosome 1, mom's chromosome 2, dad's chromosome 2, same deal over here in mitosis. In mitosis, you're going to end up with two cells that are the same. If you notice, they are exactly the same as you started with. You simply get two. But if you look at meiosis, you will see there are four cells that are not exactly the same because they have a mix match of things. They either have mom's one, dad's one, dad's two. Oh, shoot. Did I make a mistake here? Uh, yes. Darn it. Oh, darn it, darn it, darn it. I did. So you have to have one of each. So you're either going to have mom's one and dad's two. 
um, again, remember they could have there was some um, crossing over. So mom's one, dad's two, but remember these two may be slightly different. Mom's two, dad's one, and mom's two and dad's one. Darn it, I can't believe I messed that up. I'm sorry about that. So remember, you can only have one of each. One of each. See, I fixed that last night when I was watching football. Not good. So, sorry about that, but remember, one of each. One, one, and one, two. Now, you say to yourself, well, these are the same. But remember, they're not the same because there was probably some crossing over. So it's the crossing over that will make them, although they look the same, they are not exactly the same. So doing a little quick math, a cell starts with 16 chromosomes. After mitosis, you will end up with two cells, each with 16 chromosomes, exactly the same. If you start off with eight chromosomes, let's just say, new example, and you are going through meiosis, you are going to end up with four cells that have half of what you originally started with. So... So always remember the number. Chromosomes, four cells, half. I'm sorry, meiosis, four cell. Meiosis, you will end up with four cells, each with half of what you started with. And in mitosis, you will end up with two cells that are exactly what you started with. And once you have these gametes, these sperm and these eggs, they will come together in an event known as fertilization, where you have exactly one job. You want to restore the diploid number of the adult. So remember, sperm has half. Egg has half. The new zygote has a full complement. So sperm has half the amount. Egg has half the amount. Zygote will have the full amount. So in humans, for example, sperm will have 23 chromosomes. Egg will have 23 chromosomes. The zygote will end up with 46, and that's how many cells you have. This will go through mitosis, differentiation, ultimately leading to an embryo and a, and a fetus. So that's, again, a little bit down the road. Take-home message, this is a huge, another way to increase genetic diversity. And finally, I would be remiss not to add that we know if I say P53, which we kind of talked about back earlier in, in G1 phase, let's just say, P53 does not actually fix the DNA. There's, there's several other enzymes that do it. But what P53 will do, if, if it's present, it'll, it will code for that P21 gene and the P21 is super important because that stops the whole cyclin CDK process or it inactivates that process so the cell does not divide. At that time, there will be the ability to either fix the DNA or the cell decides that, you know what, it's not going to work and go through apoptosis. So don't forget about the P53 gene. And through this process, through meiosis, you may inherit a defective copy of that p53 gene and that could lead to a potential likelihood for you to get cancer if the p53 gene has been affected or is, is in some sort of mutated form so once again i hope all that helps and good luck